This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Podker. In the immune system, white blood cells help protect the body from viruses and bacteria. A subset, known as macrophages, help eliminate foreign materials by engulfing and digesting them. These cells offer great promise for cancer treatment. Our guest today is Kalade Adebowale, a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, who is investigating cell material interactions and recently published a paper looking at how these white blood cells interact with cancer cells. Dr. Adebowale, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Nathan. So uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of the background, and I, I want to know how your interest in chemistry got you into bioengineering. Mm, very interesting. So when I was a little kid, like most kids at, of my age, I was very fascinated and into science, math, and novels. And for me, chemistry was really the closest thing to magic, where you can have these molecules, you can tweak these molecules, and they can change color, they can make explosions and things like that. So this was really fascinating to me as a young teenager. And so then I began to realize as I went through high school and also through college, that we can use some of these ways of manipulating molecules to also transform biological systems to improve human health. So as, as we move into your work with human health, we I think we need to define for people what a macrophage is. Mm, yeah, exactly. So there are many, many types of immune cells in our bodies. And the jobs of these immune cells, they all have specialized functions to keep us healthy, to protect us from invading pathogens, for example. And macrophages are one type of many types of immune cells in our bodies. And broadly speaking, there are actually different types of macrophages. And there are what are called tissue resident macrophages. So these macrophages have been around in our bodies when we're an embryo and they reside in tissues. But there's another class of macrophages all so they're, they're derived from circulating monocytes and these are typically in the blood so they are a macrophage precursor and then under certain conditions they are recruited to tissues and then they become macrophages so those are the kinds of broadly the types of macrophages that we have and the job of these macrophage functions they actually perform many many functions but one of their functions is actually comes from their name which is from macro which means large and fat, which means eat. So they eat, they are large eaters. So they eat a lot of things. So things like debris or dead cells or invaded pathogens in our bodies. These immune cells are very, very good at eating that up before these pathogens can spread and cause systemic problems in our bodies. Can people think about these the same way as they might white blood cells they've heard of? Like I yeah. The terminology is a little more familiar. That's exactly correct. So macrophages are, you can think of them as a type of white blood cell. Exactly. In in some lab tests for cancer treatments, they've tried to introduce macrophages and had limited success. And this is some of what you've been working on with your paper. And I, I wanted to ask you, why are they not successful in clinical trials? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that these macrophages, it's sort of a, like an umbrella term. So there are different types of macrophages. And when people have studied these different types of macrophages, outside of a human being, so in vitro cultures, for example, they have identified that there's a specific macrophage subtype that's very, very good, at least in a petri dish, at killing cancers. And so, as you can imagine, so people have investigated the potential of these cancer-killing macrophages in a petri dish to see if it can actually be very beneficial for human patients as well. But it turns out that these specific macrophage subtype that's really good at killing cancers in a dish, it has a challenge when it's administered systemically in humans, mm -hmm. which is that while it's good at killing cancer, it's not actually very, very good at finding the cancer that it's supposed to kill. So it's not really good at hiding its targets. And the way that these macrophages work is they depend, for most of their functions, depends on physical contact with their targets. So even if they're able to kill the cancer, if they're unable to fight the cancer in the first place, right. that really limits their therapeutic efficacy. So this has been one of the barriers to so this specific macrophage cell type. How do the different tissue types, like you talked about it having to be up against it, how do the different kinds of tissue types uh, affect its effect efficiency, I guess? 
Yeah, so this is a very much an active area of investigation in uh, in research and one that I'm very much interested in. So one of the things that we know is these macrophages, they're called be phenotypically plastic, which means that there are different flavors of macrophages. You can think of them as different colors, for example. However, it appears as though they can also interconvert between different colors. So they can go from green to red to blue. And the role of tissues and the tissue environment in regulating how they convert and switch phenotypes is very much an active area of investigation. So this is something that we don't fully understand at this point, I have to admit, maybe. Um, but we're very much interested in pursuing this to really understand how this, how the how the tissue affects the types of macrophages that we observe. So, like something is acting here that's making affecting this and cr- messing with the process, uh, but it's currently not entirely clear what it is. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so part of your research has used something called a cellular backpack, and I would mm-hmm. like to hear a little bit about what is a cellular backpack and what might it be used for. Absolutely. So this term was coined by my postdoctoral mentor, Professor Samir Ritigotri, who was a professor of bioengineering at Harvard. And he developed this, it's essentially a microparticle. And this microparticle, it gets, they call it as a wafer, actually. So it's like a, it's a disc-shaped object, and it has maybe like a 10 to 1 aspect ratio. So it's kind of thin. And the reason we use the term backpack is we can take this microparticle, this wafer-like material essentially and then we can attach it to the surface of a cell and this cell can be a t cell for example it can be some kind of immune cell or we've also started ex- exploring attaching these microparticles to stem cells as well and so we use the term backpack because it's sort of like a backpack that we carry on our back so this immune cell or stem cell is also carrying this microparticle on its surface as well and what, I'm, what might it be useful? So it turns out that, as you can imagine, we have this particle that's attached to the surface of a cell. One can envision a scenario where we incorporate some drug of interest in this microparticle. This can be like a chelotherapeutic drug. It can be really like a cytokine. It can be whatever drug of interest to you. So that's one reason one might use this cellular backpacks. But even beyond that, it appears as though the mere process of attaching this microparticle to some kinds of cells, so for example, things like natural killer cells, which are a type of white blood cell, or T cells, which are another type of white blood cell, just as physical attachment, it appears as though it is able to what we call activate these cells, which means that they have an enhanced ability. It almost endows them with some kind of enhanced superpowers to be able to fight cancer specifically. So those are some of the applications of these cellular backpack materials. Very interesting. So potentially it could be used to make that macrophage cancer interaction more effective or make it be able to hone in on it. Human. That's exactly right. So one of the big issues last year or subjects that people had on the brain was machine learning and AI. And I wanted to ask about how machine learning technologies is impacting bioengineering. Oh, so that's a really big topic in bioengineering right now. And many of the machine learning algorithms are really focused on how to, on applying those algorithms to single cell RNA sequencing technology, which is really exciting. However, I have also kind of gotten into this field in a slightly different set of applications. So our paper that came out in 2023, we used some machine learning algorithms to help us predict tumor infiltration of macrophages. And so this was a really exciting study. So in this study, we grew a tumor in a petri dish in a lab, and then we investigated the ability of these different types of macrophage subtypes that I mentioned to infiltrate tumors. And it turns out that with some, some of the algorithms that already exist in terms of being able to segment out macrophages and also machine learning algorithms, we can actually predict quite efficiently the ability of different macrophage subtypes to infiltrate tumors. So this is one of applications specifically in my research. Very cool. So uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is in 2021, you got a mathematical and physical sciences ascending postdoctoral research fellowship. And this particular award, I haven't talked to anybody about on this show. So I wanted to hear about what your experience is like and what work you did under that grant. 
Yeah, so I was really fortunate to get this uh, NS. This was an NSF fellowship, and it was actually I was the inaugural cohort for this mathematical and physical sciences assigned to postdoctoral research fellowship. And this research fellowship, you know, it really has been transformative. So I got this fellowship right before I started my postdoc. And so going into the postdoc with some pot of money really afforded me the flexibility to do research that I was specifically interested in. And I was really interested in in the basic and fundamental interactions between these backpack, these microparticles, and cells. So that's really what this fellowship was, 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 was funded for. And so it provided a lot of financial supports. They gave me a lot of flexibility when I started my postdoc in 2021. But also beyond that, the NSF has really built this program so not only provides financial support, but also support for, for like other kinds of training support. So they also, they really tried to build a cohort where every month we get together with other people in this program, other postdoctoral fellows. We compare notes, talk about how our experiences are in academia. There was a lot of mentorship through this program. And so this program really, for me, has been quite transformative in so many ways, beyond just the financial aspect, but also just in terms of training or my future steps as well as a professor. So it really has been extremely, extremely helpful. And I'm really grateful for that at the NSF for, for, for supporting my, my career this way. Okay. So one of the other things you worked on, and, and you kind of mentioned mentoring, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, is something called Bioengineering Science, Technology, and Research Program, Biostorm. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to hear a little bit about your take on the importance of mentoring and working mm-hmm. with younger students. Mm-hmm. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. So basically, mentoring and outreach has been a critical part of my scientific career throughout. And I, you know, one of the things that gives me so much joy and gives me just bigger and life is working with students, specifically K through 12 students, and doing hands-on experiments, and really trying to get them excited about science. Because I'm also, I'm very excited about science. And I want to really contribute to the mission of encouraging and getting the next generation of scientists very excited about science as well, and to make them understand and realize that the research and scientific enterprise really, we're really looking forward to their contributions to science as well. And so when I got to Harvard, I had this unique opportunity to work on this summer program, this Biostar program, where we'd have students come in and they do labs in our engineer, in our engineer facility at Harvard. And there was an opportunity to work with these students. And I jumped in an opportunity at the, the first, as soon as I got that email, I'm like, you know, sign me up. I want to do this. And so that was really exciting working with these students to learn microscopy, to learn how to grow tumor steroids in a lab, to learn how to do image processing and data analysis. And also at the end of this program, the students also put together a research poster and the quality of these research posters are, you know, very, very impressive. So these are really bright students. And this experience has made me very optimistic about the future of science in, in the country. And it gives you a chance to really capture the imagination when you're doing it hands on. Because this is, I'm imagining this is most of these kids first time being in a lab and seeing what actual science is or what that work might be. That's exactly right. That's a good. So first time in a lab at a place like Harvard. The facilities are quite extensive and they get to work with their hands. And it's not just, they do, they, there are lectures, lectures as well, but there are, it also is a lot of hands-on experience working with teams. So I really think every students have always, they, they do provide some feedback after the program and the program always receives very, very high marks from students. So I think the students really enjoy this program as well. Very cool. So, so the last thing in my in my kind of setup questions here is I wanted to ask you what was the next step in your research? What's coming up for you? Oh yeah, sure. So there are many things that are coming up, Nathan. But maybe one that I'll talk about very briefly is we also realized I'm really interested in cancer in general and how we can develop better therapies to treat all kinds of cancers. And one of the things that has been transformative over the last few years with the number of technologies that have come online is that there really is a cast of characters that supports the development of cancers. And it's not just the tumor cells themselves. So the tumors, the cancer cells, 
they also have to rely on other cells to support their growth and development. And it turns out that is a specific pair of immune cells. So these macrophage cells that we talked about earlier, and also T cells, these two cells are typically found in close proximity from human biopsy samples. But we don't really know how these cells got together in the first place. These macrophages, which is a type of immune cell, and a T cell, another type of immune cell, how did they get together in the first place? And what are the functional consequences of this physical proximity? So these are things that we currently don't fully understand right now. But in the future, I want to contribute to helping elucidate how these cells got together in the first place and what the functional consequence of this macrophage immune cell and T cell immune cell physical proximity is. Okay, and this is going to be my actual last question. Do you think it's an inevitability that we will have a cure for cancer, like across the board? Because I know, I know people, when they think of that, they're not really accounting for all the variants that there are. There's so many kinds of cells and kinds of cancers. But do you think the time will come where we'll have a cure for it? You know, that's such a, that's such a great question. And I'll start by saying there is a lot of raising to be hopeful because we really have put a lot of cancers in long lasting remissions for a lot of patients, mostly for patients with hematological or blood cancers. It's turned out to be a much more difficult problems with solid cancers and solid cancers comprise greater than 90% of adult cancer. So this is a big unmet clinical need. But I will say there are a lot of challenges, but at the same time, there really is a lot of reason to be optimistic that we're going to develop very potent therapies against many cancers, and we can put a lot of cancers in remission for a very long time. So there is a lot of reason to be hopeful, is my short answer. Yeah. Special thanks to Kalade Adebowale for the Discovery Files Omni Podcast. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.